Hello, today we are starting a new series of videos. These will be dedicated to the human papilloma virus, or HPV. We're going to have a discussion over a range of topics, which will be covered in detail in the upcoming videos. Today, I'm going to do just a short review, a brief introduction in which I'll mention the specific subjects we are going to discuss in the future. We will be talking about what HPV is, which tissues and organs are mostly affected by the virus, what is a high risk and what is a low risk strain. Most importantly, we'll be talking in details and probably I'll dedicate several videos on how exactly a human gets infected with HPV. What are the ways to get protected to a certain degree? What are the different disinfectants that do work and do not work against these viruses? And also, we're going to mention certain facts on the available vaccines. HPV is a virus that specifically infects epithelial cells. And when we think of epithelial tissue, we all think of our skin, the mucous membranes, your genitals, your mouth, your pharynx, etc. Which is to say that HPV can infect many more parts of your body than just your genitals. We currently know over 170 types, over 170 strains of the HPV virus. Some of those strains has been shown to be linked and furthermore, to cause cancer. These strains are called the high-risk ones. These are strains 16, 18, 31, 33, 35, 39, 45, 51, 52, 56, 58, 59, 68, 73, 82. And this list is probably going to grow in the next several years. Because HPV is just becoming a focus of scientific investigation. We know that HPV is transmitted mostly in a sexual way. But when I say sex, I don't just limit it to vaginal sex. HPV can be transmitted by any, even remotely sexual activity. Because the way the infection happens is, what is required for HPV transmission is skin contact. Unlike other sexually transmitted disease where an actual exchange of either blood or any biological matrices is required, for HPV transmission, I repeat, the only thing that is required is skin contact. In other words, touch. So consider this. You could get infected with HPV by having sex, in the classical meaning of the word, by having oral sex, by just touching the infected region of a person who already has HPV. You can get HPV by simple kissing, because HPV can infect, and it does infect, the oral cavity as well. Actually, there are several studies that just came out which show a linkage between the number of not just lifetime sexual partners, but also the linkage between the number of lifetime mouth-to-mouth -mouth kissing partners and oropharyngeal cancers. We will also discuss the possibility of transmission of HPV through something as simple as a handshake. There are several studies which address that possibility. They've been looking into the viral titer or the amount of viral particles on the fingertips or the palms of the hands of people who are diagnosed with genital HPV strains. What these studies found was a bit concerning. Actually, they report anywhere between 10 to 15 percent, I repeat, 10 to 15 percent of people who have genital HPV infection show that they have enough viral particles 
on the fingertips and the palms of their hands as well so that they could be detected with our far from perfect methods. We are also going to discuss the way HPV can be transmitted through asexual activities. In other words, contact with contaminated surfaces. How using, how frequently using public swimming pool increases your risk of acquiring an HPV infection. There were several studies that were done in children, statistical studies, which show that kids who frequently use public swimming pools actually have higher incidence of HPV infection. Actually, very recently a new study came out where the researchers took samples of swimming pools which were adequately chlorinated. They did contain the required amount of chlorine in them. So they took samples from those pools and they used modern molecular methods to see if they can detect HPV viruses in this water. The results were rather concerning. Over 60% of the water samples contained at least four strains of HPV. And this study just added more to that broader picture which was initiated with the statistical studies. So now we know people who frequently visit swimming pools have higher risk of getting an HPV infection. And we also know from very recently that indeed in those swimming pool waters there is HPV viral particles. We will discuss other possibilities of getting infected with HPV from contaminated surfaces. We'll talk about the high risk of using common towels, for example. We will address a question which has been bothering people for quite some while, and this is, can you get an HPV infection by using a public toilet? Now, we will address several studies on the subject, and you'll see that actually the results are rather concerning. It was believed several years ago that HPV can indeed be shed and left onto a toilet seat from a person who has the infection. But it was also believed that the survival time of the virus on a dry surface was within several minutes. This was then. Very recently some studies came out which actually show that HPV-16, for example, probably the highest risk strain, can survive on a dry surface for over three days. Now you can see how scientific knowledge and beliefs change very quickly. Just a few years ago, we were talking about several minutes, and today we are suspecting at least three days of survival of that specific strain on a dry surface. But even if I have to go back in time, and go to those few years ago when people were saying, oh, the virus will probably not be transmitted easily through a public toilet. There were still voices back then which were saying, yes, based on our current perception back then, that the virus can survive only for five minutes on that dry surface, which the toilet seat is. It usually takes more time from one person to get out of the toilet and another one to get in, so the risk is low. But how about if that toilet sea surface is not dry? How about if there is something left there, a drop of water, a drop of urine? Now this will be a moist environment, sufficient to provide a longer life of that virus. Furthermore, people were discussing the possibility, the probability, a viral transmission through fomites. What fomites are, these are small particles of your body, which can provide physiological environment for the virus to survive in for a longer period of time than a regular dry surface. This could be a tiny, almost microscopical scale of skin that was shed. This could be a drop of urine, a drop of saliva, any real, really body particle that can be shed without your knowledge.
So these were long suspected to be the reason why we see that adults who have HPV infection seem to infect their children as well. We are also going to talk about chemical disinfectants because new things are found there as well. A very recent study, by the way, looked into a range of chemical disinfectants and try to identify which one of those affect the virus and which ones are completely useless. And the results were rather concerning again. What was found was that, in the case of HPV-16, for example, the classical disinfectants and the recommended disinfectants that are currently used, as I speak, in hospital and dental practices actually are not effective against HPV-16 in any manner whatsoever. The authors of the study actually published an urgent recommendation for all hospitals and dental practices to review and to update their protocols of chemical disinfection. Once again, we'll discuss that in detail in one of the coming videos. But for now, in case many of you are wondering and asking yourselves, does any alcohol-based disinfectant work against HPV? The answer is, depending on the strain, most likely no. For sure we know that at least several high-risk strains which were tested with alcohol-based disinfectants, the effect of ethanol or isopropanol on those is practically zero. So, with the specific example of HPV-16, you can drown that thing in tons of alcohol and this will not kill the virus at all. We are going to dedicate several videos on the subject of how can you get protected or more accurately said, how can you decrease your risk of getting infected with HPV. And it seems that what we currently know leads us to only one conclusion. From a point of view of lifestyle and behavior, the only thing you can do, and actually this is the official recommendation of the CDC, is to have a mutually monogamous relationship with another person who does not have HPV. And indeed, there is a number of studies which show linkage between the number of lifetime sexual partners one has and his risk of getting an HPV infection, therefore his risk of getting an HPV-induced cancer. We're talking about studies that show us that linkage between the number of lifetime sexual partners, as I said, the number of lifetime oral sex partners, and the number of the lifetime mouth-to-mouth -mouth kissing partners. Now, these are all activities that have been found to be the major way to acquire an HPV infection. And the number of people these activities are done with correlates with the risk of getting an HPV infection. And I can guess that some of you are already wondering, is there a critical number? Is there a number of sex partners above which the risk becomes much higher? And, and I can tell you here, before discussing it in detail, as I mentioned, I can tell you here that there are a couple of studies which show that, for example, people who have up to five, between one and five oral sex partners, have over 200% increased risk of getting oropharyngeal cancer versus the people who report zero oral sex partners. Now, when that number grows from 5 to 9, the risk of getting cancer increases 500% versus the one who report zero partners. The same applies to vaginal sex partners. The higher the number, the higher the risk. So stick with the discussion. We will talk about those numbers. You will see what happens to people who have up to five partners 
we'll see what happens to people who have from five to nine partners. And you will be surprised at the incredible increase in risk measured as percentage of people who are infected with HPV among those people who have over 10 lifetime sexual partners. So this is where we are going to stop today. As I mentioned in the beginning and probably 50 times during my talk, this is just an introduction. If you want to hear more on those subjects, give me some kind of a sign. You can like that video, you can leave a comment below so that you give me some indication that what I intend to do, which will be a lot of work, I will be going through many scientific papers, I will be reviewing them and I will be conveying them in a more common everyday language, whether that effort will be worthwhile.